Yes, did you get the figures from Parker? What was that? Does he have the completed report? That's not what he told me. So what have you got going on today? Oh, just covering a couple of events. A movie called The Ultimate Life and The Secret Knock. It's mm -hmm. Boring stuff. What have you got there? Oh, it's my... The book I started writing a while back. I think you should start writing again. I'm a journalist. I do write. No, I don't mean that. I mean the stuff that makes you happy. Anyway, I gotta go. of The Secret Knock, Greg Scott Reed! Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. Have a seat. All right, I want to share with you guys a story today. You know, a lot of people know a gentleman named Napoleon Hill, but not everyone knows the story behind the story. See, Napoleon Hill was an aspiring magazine reporter, and he gained access to the richest man of the world at the time, Andrew Carnegie. And at this meeting, Carnegie took a liking to him. He says, you know, I kind of like you, and here's a golden chance. One thing, will you accept it? He says, if you're willing to work for me for free, for 20 years, I'll send you on a mission to meet the most powerful and influential people of our time. Napoleon Hill <laughs> thought to himself and said, work for free for what? <laughs> he reached in his pocket and realized He's got nothing to lose, but he's got everything to gain. He turned to his guests and says, Mr. Carnegie, not only will I accept your mission, but rest assured, I promise you, I'm going to complete it. Carnegie takes him by the hand and says, I not only like what you said, <laughs> I like the way you said it. You got yourself a job. But then Hill says, why are people going to talk to me? You know, I'm just the kid. I'm nobody. And he says, that's easy. I'm going to write you a letter a letter of recommendation. And when people see it, they're going to know I sent you and give you a few moments of their time. From there, he sat down with Edison and the Rockefellers, J.C. Penney's, the Henry Ford. And he got to pick the brains of that world's top thought leaders to find out exactly what they did, their formula for success. So I asked the president and CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation for an opportunity. He said, will you allow me to go around the country and interview today's top thought leaders to find out why they didn't quit just three feet away from their own vein of gold? 
And from there, the stories were absolutely amazing. But I got to tell you, the relationship I met with the CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation is what truly changed my life. Who here would like to have had the opportunity to sit down with the CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation and pick his brain? I got great news. He's right here. Don Green, come on up, buddy. We go through three stages in life. One of them is learning, one's earning, and one's sharing. We should be doing all three of them at one time. Uh, but most people never leave the first stage, which is earning. They're, they're surviving. I got a quote from Meisner who said was, if you, all you demand out of life is food, clothing, and shelter, you get all three of them in prison. That's surviving. <laughs> most, people, most people, they only survive. You know, the, and the other stages go to is, the second one should, uh, should be done at the same time you're doing the first one, and the third one should be done at the same time. We should be learning, earning, and sharing, because that's what's life all about. When it comes down to stickability, if somebody has a dream, if someone has a vision, what's the one tip you would give them to not give up on their dream before the miracle happens? Well, start figuring out what's next. If it doesn't work, I mean, uh, you know, I'm like Richard Vos found the damn way. I read a quote from him one time. He says, and he's about like, about like what uh, Steve Jobs said. He said, get knocked down 70 times. And he said, I'm jumping up far, and here comes 71. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Don Green. There you go. Take that with you. Thank you. Let me have it. Thank you. So the journey continues, and it all continues with another letter. You see, Don Green was so graciously wrote another recommendation so we can go on a journey to create the next chapter in personal development, Think and Grow Rich, Stickability. And just like the great Andrew Carnegie wrote a letter of recommendation for Napoleon Hill, well, guess what? Don Green wrote a letter of his own. And this one opened the doors of opportunity so I could sit down with some amazing people. And we did it under the one rule that Napoleon Hill said is the key to personal success and no matter what we do, and that's creating a mastermind. So what I did is I put together a personal mastermind group where we came together as a collective soul and we went on a journey to sit down and pick the brains of today's top thought leaders to find out exactly what they did to persevere through their most challenging moments. And they asked me real quick off the top, can we go interview the one and only Peter Diamandis? The most limited resource in the universe is the mindset. The most critical thing is if you believe it, and if you can create the mindset that people believe it, then it is doable. And that's what X Prize is about. It's saying this can be done. And the money goes to the person who accomplishes this specific task. I don't care where you went to school, what you've ever done before. If you pull this off, you win. Now, those of you who don't know who Peter is, trust me, you do know what he created. See, he founded an organization called the X Prize. Now, the X Prize was a concept. The whole idea was to see if someone could take a human being and civilian person and they could launch them to space 62 miles up and return them back to earth and i asked them one simple question i go peter you know what's your mission i mean what's your goal what, what's your thought process for your stickability why in the world would you not quit and throw in the towel through your biggest adversities and he said the greatest line he says you know while so many people are working to make this planet a better place i'm doing my best to get off it so I can make the perfect world for somebody else. Oh, pretty powerful, right? And I go, that's called dreaming. Who here would like to sit down and meet with Peter Diamandis? He's not here. <laughs> but we did have an opportunity to sit down with some amazing human beings. Individuals that have done things and achieved success in a level that few could even comprehend. Imagine learning from Leah O'Brien Amica, who won three gold medals in the Olympics. Adversity introduces a man's character to himself. And I believe that's true because anyone can go out there and can win and can have it all and put a smile on their face and just keep trucking. But what happens when things get hard? That's when you find out what you're really made of. Can you fight back? Are you going to give up? And how are you going to respond? We even got invited to the home of Matt Mullenweg, inventor of WordPress. We got to pick his brain on the power of cooperation. We even went knees and knees with Nick Hallett, known worldwide as the Thrillionaire. Here, I even brought some video so you can see what he's about.
the first decade of his life, Nick Halleck was medically confined to his bedroom. So, at age eight, he drafted the screenplay of his life, including his top ten list of goals. At age 14, he opened up his very first business. At age 17, he relocated to Hollywood, California to perform live on stage. At age 19, he bought his very first investment property. Five years later, he became a multimillionaire. Now he owns private homes in the most beautiful places on earth. Nick traverses the planet and pursues exciting, high adrenaline and epic adventures. He has summited the highest mountains in the world and visited over 100 countries. He's dived down five miles and had lunch on the bow of the shipwreck Titanic. He empowers thousands of individuals, passionately sharing his life story and insights on how to live a true life. In 2009, he wrote an additional goal to create and inspire one million new thrillionaires across the globe and to self-fund the building of educational schools in poor remote villages across South America and Africa. Nick became a flight qualified and certified civilian astronaut. Now he's set to rocket to outer space, live on a space station, and with future plans to walk the lunar surface of the moon, completing the remainder of his original top 10 list of goals. Gene Landrum, famous for bringing a rat into the restaurant business. You probably know that best as Chuck E. Cheese. You got a big dilemma? Dr. Gene said, go to the beach. Go to the beach. Get out of your office, get out of there, and suddenly you're able to see stuff that you couldn't see sitting in the middle of the dilemma. Now, one of the next interviews I got to do is sit down with Marty Cooper. Now, Marty Cooper invented something that you guys use each and every day. And you might not know his name, but you do know what he created. Has anyone ever heard of something called a cell phone? <laughs> right? Where would our life be without this guy? But his story was absolutely amazing. So the other night, I'm watching 60 Minutes, and I see this guy pop on the screen, Marty Cooper. Now, you might not know his name, but trust me, you do know what he created. You ever seen one of these things? A cell phone. <laughs> That's right, the guy who actually created it. Remember the big old bricks from back in the day? Well, we have a very unique opportunity to go right here in his office of Del Mar, California, and pick the brain of exactly how this came to be. Come along, won't you? So stickability, if someone's gonna give up, someone's faced with a challenge, someone's going through something and they're ready to throw in the towel, do you have a little nugget of information or a little wisdom that you'd pass on? Well, first of all, uh, there's gotta be a balance. You can, you can carry the stickability uh, too far. Uh, there, there has to be a practical element. Uh, knowing that something is true when it really isn't, that's no big help either, is it? The obstacles, can do one of two things. They can make you quit, mm -hmm. or they can reinforce your resolution. It's very easy to talk about the people who've been successful and who stick with it and make it happen. Examine the successes of all these people that you're talking about. I'll bet you they make course changes all along the way. They listen to the rest of the world, and uh, they don't just bump their heads against uh, walls. They, uh, they adjust. Their ability I think it has to be consistent with uh, flexibility. Stickability has to be parallel with flexibility. It seems like every top thought leader that we sat down with said the same thing. If you're not willing to adapt, if you're not willing to adjust, if you're not willing to roll with the punches, you're going to end up just being stuck. And no story illustrates that better than the spider monkey. Now, if those of you who don't know the spider monkey story, you see in the rainforest, the spider monkey is the most quick, fast, nimble creature in the world. You can't harpoon it, you can't spear it, you can't catch it. It's just too quick. But one hunter came up with a solution. See, he took a giant heavy log and drilled a tiny hole inside and dropped a peanut in the base. He dropped that log at the bottom of the jungle and the monkeys would smell that nut. Coming down from the treetops, the monkeys would reach inside and grab a hold of that nut, and their fists would become so big, couldn't pull it out of that log and just become anchored. An hour later, the hunters would come by, knock them over the head, put the monkey in the bag, and capture the elusive spider monkey. Now, all the monkey's gotta do is let go, pull his hand out to live to fight another day. But that monkey thinks that nut is saving him. That's the nutrition, that's the value, they have to have it. Well, here's the question. How many times have we or someone we know, or are we going through it right now, where we're holding on to our own nut in life? 
whether it be a bad job, relationship, fear, a car, remorse. And we think that that is saving us, but ultimately it's leading to our own demise. The person you're seeing on the screen right now, his name is Ron Klein. Now, Ron Klein invented something that, again, we use, I believe, pretty much each and every day, especially my wife does, at least. The realities are he created something called the credit card magnetic strip. People call him the grandfather of possibilities. And he always talks about what can be rather than the obstacle. He looks at the, the solution, the possibility. And with your permission, I want to ask you, who here would like to meet Ron Klein? Unfortunately, Ron Klein couldn't make it. Just kidding. Here's Ron. Come on up, Ron. There. There you go, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat, Ron. So, Ron, the, the question I have for you is pretty simple. When you have an idea, you say that you always look at the beginning and the end, and you don't get caught up in the minutia, the middle part. Could you explain what that means to you? Well, the first thing you have to have is a can-do attitude. There's not a thing you can't accomplish and thing you can't do. If somebody comes to me with a problem, or if I have a problem myself, you can't solve problems unless it's a challenge. Well, it seems like so many people quit because they have a great idea, and they have a vision of how it's going to change the world, but as soon as they have a challenge, as soon as they have a struggle, they quit and they fold up the, the tent, right? So what's your one tip of inspiration to help people keep going forward? Flexibility. <laughs> Flexibility. You must be ready to make a move. And failure is only another way of learning. So you, again, go back to what was the given and what's the solution we're looking for. And don't be concerned with the failure of the journey in between because it's just another hurdle. It's kind of interesting is that Ron's been here for the last two days and he's been sitting among everybody, but has everyone reached out to get to know Ron Klein yet? And the realities are there's excellent people everywhere seated inside here, but are you going to start asking the right questions and reaching out to these people so you can start building them into your sphere of influence? 80% of everything you need is already within your circle. Will you start seeking it so you can start applying it so you can reap the rewards? Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the one and only Ron Klein. Now, stickability doesn't always have to be in the form of a business. Pem Sherpa is the person you're looking up there on the screen. You see, his story is one of love. One of love that I've never heard before in entire life. You see, he grew up at the base of Mount Everest, and he fell in love with another woman from Kathmandu. One was a Buddhist and one was a Hindu, and it was forbidden for either one of them to engage in a relationship. And he looked up to the top of the mountain and says, do we agree between the two cities that the one God we both agree to is that mountain? And she said, yes. And says, if you'll go with me, I want to go on top of that mountain with you and proclaim my love. They walked to the very top, climbed and summited Mount Everest. And they're the very first couple in the history of the world to actually exchange their vows and get married on top of the mountain. Well, I think it's uh, my best point is, you know, the storm always end. One of my friends told me this, and I believe that because the peop in people's life, every minute there is a challenge, and you have to face that, and it will go away and shine, shine next day for sure. So by shining a light on what fears you or scares you, it gives you the inspiration and courage to actually deal with it and face it. Right. A lot of people don't know this, but the real danger and challenge is coming back down the mountain. You see, that's where all the pitfalls and all the danger truly lies ahead. Well, his wife, being unfamiliar with climbing such a mountain, she didn't have the right goggles and actually went snow blind. Oh my goodness, could you imagine what Pem was experiencing? All of a sudden, his newfound bride couldn't even see. They go halfway down that mountain and sure enough, they finally find the rescue center with a helicopter starts coming down to rescue them and take them to safety. And what happens? The helicopter crashes right before them. Oh my goodness. Well, a couple hours later, another helicopter comes to rescue them, but they get altitude sickness. So the first helicopter's crew has to rescue that helicopter crew and finally take them to the base of the mountain to freedom. 
where they go to America to experience their new life together. Now, here's the big moral. How many times have we or someone we know are willing to go all in for love? I thought his story was so good, it should become a major motion picture. And I says, you know what, Pam? I'm going to go down and find a movie producer, someone in Hollywood who's done something big. I said, well, who's done the big films like Mothman Prophecies and Under Siege and Pretty Woman? I says, I got to pick this guy's brain and see if we can make this a major motion picture. And guess who I found? Gary Goldstein, the actual movie producer. And I wanted to sit down with him and ask him real simple, is this possible? But in that meeting, I found out something even more important. He had a stickability story that was like nothing else I had ever heard. Who here would like to have met Gary Goldstein? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Gary Goldstein. Come on up, buddy. <laughs> but the one film that really, you know, touched your heart was called the... The Mothman Prophecies. I mean, like I said, every film dies before it ever has a chance of being birthed into the world. So I sent it over to a, a, one of the agents at Lakeshore who read it. Um, I got a call the following Monday from not one but three of the executives. She had shared it. They all got on the phone and regaled me with how wonderful the script was. It was brilliantly crafted. It was an absolutely fascinating, based on a true story, which it was. Uh, and uh, they kept going on compliment after compliment with the final sentence. Thank you so much for sending it over. It's going to be a pass. That's a cul-de-sac moment. That's like, oh, big silent pause. It's do or die. So after a long pause, I said to them, I respectfully pass on your pass. <laughs> and they giggled. And I requested, out of a respectful relationship that we'd had over time, we'd never worked together, but we knew each other well, that we have a face-to-face -face meeting. And they said, absolutely, please come on in. And in that moment, in that room, they changed their minds. And that's not a casual change of heart. That taught me everything you'd ever want to learn in life, right? And it's, it's Literally, you, you just have to not hear the word no. No is a conversation starter. <laughs> it means take a deeper cut, tell a better story, believe in yourself more, put your foot on the pedal harder, and keep going. One's climbing a mountain, one's going to Hollywood. But the realities are we're all faced challenges in our lives. But are we going to be flexible enough to adapt and adjust, or are we going to end up just being stuck and run away in fear? Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the one and only Gary Goldstein. Let me have that microphone. You know, I asked a lot of people one question. It says, if there is one determining factor that holds people back more than anything else, what would it be? And it comes down to one simple word, and that word is fear. Fear of failure, fear of judgment, fear of the unknown, whatever it is, fear is what holds us back. Now, you know her from the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series, co-author with me for Three Feet from Gold. But she also serves on the president's board of advisors for financial literacy. She owns corporations, and she's a philanthropist. And she's also a great mentor, a friend, and an ally. Would anyone like to meet Sharon? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sharon Lecter. Come on up, Sharon. <laughs> you are now an expert in outwitting the devil of the fear. And Napoleon Hill, when he talked about the six ghosts of fear, he talked about the fear of old age, the fear of dying, the fear of you know, poverty and things of that nature. And one of the conversations that you and I have had is said that a lot of those fears are also a little bit more modernized where it's a fear of judgment, it's a fear of the unknown, it's a fear of pain, the fear of loss. Would you share with everyone what your definition of fear and what that is? The definition of fear is really the lack of faith. Hmm. And one that I think really cripples a lot of people today is the fear of criticism because what we see all around us are people judge themselves through other people's eyes. And so they want to be the, for me, you know, I want to be the best mother, the best grandmother, the best partner, the best writer, but you have to start with the best you. Mm. Fear is a, is, a, is a mechanism. So you choose whether you, and fear can motivate you. There's nothing wrong with fear. It's like courage. People say courage is the absence of fear. No, I think fear, courage, 
is acting in spite of fear. Mm. Knowing that fear is part of life. We're humans. We have that thing called emotions. And so embrace them and say, what's the lesson? What's the lesson I'm supposed to learn? So I don't go back to that same spot, but keep going because you can get through that fear and turn that into motivation to create the life you deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Sharon Lecter. Very, very nice. Very good, Sharon. You know, so many people look at limiting beliefs, they look at their limits, they look at their problems, they look at their challenges, but they don't look at the possibilities, the potential of literally what lies in their lap. One interview that Don Green insisted that I do is with a gentleman named Jim Stovall. Now, Jim Stovall created a book, a masterpiece, and a film called The Ultimate Gift. Now, The Ultimate Gift is one of the greatest books you'll ever read in personal development on mentorship. Well, that movie became such a great success, they asked him to actually do a, a remake, which is going to be coming out real soon, called The Ultimate Life. But the story of Jim Stovall is he's visually impaired, and he realized that his setback, a handicap that other people would see, actually was a blessing in disguise. You see, I interviewed him, and I asked him this simple question. What would you rather have, vision or your sight? Well, I've had sight and I've had vision. Sight is a precious gift. I had it for the first portion of my life. And sight tells you where you are and what's around you. But vision is infinitely more valuable because vision tells you where you could be and what is possible. And uh, enjoy your sight, but treasure your vision. Absolutely amazing. And you also said that if you had a choice to choose between, which would you take? Absolutely. And, I, you know, it's interesting. That's a lesson I got from my late great friend Ray Charles. And I heard him say once that uh, if he had the opportunity to have his sight back, but he had to lose his music, he would just stay the way he was. And uh, at the time, I thought, what an amazing statement. Years later, I came to understand it. But, uh, hey, um, sight is good. Vision is, is, is everything. And if I had to choose between the two, I'll take vision every time. Before he lost his eyesight, he had a pretty good life. I mean, he was a regular Joe. But as soon as he lost his sight and he gained his vision, he became an internationally renowned public speaker, author, filmmaker, and now they're releasing the Ultimate Life movie, which I'm going to tell you right now is going to become a Hollywood blockbuster. Now, moving forward, I had an opportunity to sit down with Mike Muni, the person who created ACT Software. The first way to stay in touch for a CRM system for sales professionals and everyone alike. But as soon as he sold that business at an early age, he questioned himself, what would I do next? Then you started a new venture, and all of a sudden passion came back into your life. So I'm floundering again. I mean, what do you do with time when all your friends are working? Um, and so I just had this a spiral cool. down of nothing to do that was meaningful to me. ACT was such a success, everything else was anticlimactic. Now maybe that was a perspective I self-imposed, but nonetheless, it was my perspective, and so I didn't enjoy anything. Wow. If you don't, do you feel if you're not driving, if you're not working towards something that kind of we don't have a sense of purpose? In my case, I would say, yeah. I don't, uh, I, I have a rebellious chromosome. I have an anti-authoritarian chromosome. I want to be in charge. I want to make a difference and I want to be what I'm supposed to be. And I'm not there yet. So I'm not willing to give up. It's a, it's a force of will in me, a yearning to still realize at the end of my life that I do everything I was capable of doing. And I'm not there yet. And act certainly wasn't it. Now, what gives Mike stickability is the feeling like he hasn't accomplished everything he's meant to. And the bottom line is that that feeling, that energy, is what thrives him and moves him forward. And the big question is, what unfinished business do you have right now? Do you have more to give? Do we have more of a legacy to leave on this big spinning rock we call Earth? I've always understood the power of modern technology. And you always want to be on the cutting edge of what's coming next. The next interview that I had an opportunity to do was to sit down with the co-creator of Apple. You know him as Steve Wozniak, the Woz. As a kid, Steve Wozniak, you know, other kids were reading all those different 
magazines like comics or whatever. He sent away to Hewler Packard and all these computer companies. And he got the manuals because you could get them for free. So he'd stay at home as a kid and read computer manuals. You know, the big giant ones for the reel to reel size of a room. And he wanted to know how they worked. And that's what inspired him. That's what got him fired up in the morning. And he says one day he's going to build his own computer. But there was a blessing. He said he had no money. And that was the greatest blessing he ever had. And this is what he said. We worked with what we had. and We had almost no money, Steve Jobs and myself. And so we had to figure out ways to build things that cost almost no money. And it forced us to think and think and come up with new approaches. And if we had had all the money in the world, Heck, we might have just been satisfied buying things the way they were, just becoming another so-so company. You know, by the time we actually made it at Apple, I looked back and all of the little A-plus projects I had worked on, one after another after another, totally wacko different ideas than the world had ever seen in computers, every one of them came about largely because I had no money and had to figure out ways to do things with just a few $1 chips and partly because I had never done it before and that enabled me to think out the cleanest possible, shortest way you could without saying I just do it the standard way that you learn in a book. The realities are he started thinking outside the box, not because he's cool or rich or successful. That's all he had. That was the only resource. And he says, thank goodness, because the personal computing industry would have changed dramatically if they had more dough, because he would have built one the size of a skyscraper. Having the opportunity to sit with the people that have encouraged us and inspired us, one person really stuck out for me. And one person I want to make sure I had access to was the one and only Frank Shankwitz. Now, those of you who don't know his name, you do know the industry he started. Put your hands together for the founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Frank Shankowitz. Come on up, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. I tip my hat to you. Thank you. Thank you. You were a police officer for how many years? 40 years. 40 years. You just retired? Just retired. As a detective? Yes, homicide detective. But did you ever think that you would have started one of the largest nonprofits the world's ever seen? No. <laughs> <You're>... No. <laughs> and, and tell us real quick the story of how it came to be. In 1980, I was a motorcycle officer, Arizona Highway Patrol. And at that time, the TV show Chips was very popular. We were told of a little seven year old boy named Chris. Chris had leukemia. Chris only had a couple weeks to live, and the only thing that got Chris through his days was watching Chips. They had arranged in his hospital room for a VCR so he could watch the programs over and over. He just loved Chips, and he told his mother, when I grow up, I'm going to be a highway patrol motorcycle officer. I was introduced to Chris, and I, he asked if we can do something special as doctors and his mom. Yes, we can. With the permission of our commanders, we set up a special day for Chris. He was picked up in our highway patrol helicopter at his hospital, flown to our headquarters building. And when they landed, I expected, I was standing by with my motorcycle. When they landed, I expect our paramedics to help this little boy out of the helicopter. Instead, here comes this seven-year-old bundle of energy just running over high five. Hi, I'm Chris. And he was so awed because our motorcycles, our uniforms outside of say in Arizona were exactly like chips. As far as he was concerned, he was, I was very red hair and very tan at the time, so I could have been Ponch and John, either one. <laughs> but he was just fascinated by this. And, and this little wish of his was becoming true. And I'm watching him, and I knew he was very ill, but he's bouncing around like a typical seven-year-old. I'm looking at his mother, and, and she has just got tears in her eyes because she has her little boy back, her little seven-year-old boy having fun. Chris went on that day to become the first and only uh, child to become an honorary highway patrolman to the day in the history of the Arizona Highway Patrol. We presented him with a badge, we presented him with a smoky hat, and he went toured our, our armory. He just had a great day, and his doctor was with him. In fact, he was so having so much fun, so pumped up, the doctor told his mother, take him home. He doesn't have to go back to the hospital let him go home, and Chris went home that night. But we realized that we have now a highway patrolman, he has a hat, he has a badge, but doesn't have a uniform. We went to uniform shop in those days that were custom made, and we asked the seamstress, can you maybe make, we have this boy seven years old, this high, this wide, can you make a uniform? They spent all night 
make it a little uniform for Chris. The next morning, again, with Mission Mark Commanders, I led a group out to his house, uh, several motorcycles, squad cars, sirens going, you can imagine the neighbors, right? <laughs> and Chris comes running out, and we hand him the uniform, and he is just, just ecstatic. He runs inside, gets it all dressed up, puts on a smoky hat, and he is just comes out, just look at me, I'm just proud as can be. But he came over to me and he was fascinated by the wings that we wear, motorcycle officers, and he said, but how do I become a motorcycle officer like you and Ponch and John? And I was just saying, well, Chris, this is the testing we do, and we go, well, da, 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 and if only you had a motorcycle, we could test you right here. Chris was a step ahead of me. He ran in the house and came riding out with a little battery-operated motorcycle that his mother had got for him in place of a wheelchair. We set up traffic cones in the driveway, and he had a helmet that he put on, and in fact, he had put on what we call mucking boots that were rubber boots that looked like our motorcycle boots, and very seriously went through these cones with his little motorcycle. He came over there and he said, did I pass? I said, yes, you did pass, Chris. Am I going to be a motorcycle officer? Yes, you are, Chris. And the wings, again, were custom ordered. They just couldn't buy them off the shelf. And again, he got to stay home that night. I called the jeweler and the same thing. We've got this little boy. We need some wings. He spent all night casting those wings. The next morning, I get a call. The wings are ready. I went to pick them up. I get another call. Chris is in a hospital, in a coma. He's not going to survive the day. Went to the hospital. His uniform is hanging right by the bed. Just as I pinned on the wings, Chris came out of the coma. He looked at me. He said, am I a motorcycle officer now? Yes, you are, Chris. He just started smiling and laughing. He started talking to his mom. He had the greatest couple of hours, and then he passed away. I always help think maybe those wings helped carry him to heaven. We learned Chris was going to be buried in Illinois. I was asked if I would go back with another officer and give Chris a police funeral. We had lost a fellow officer, which we did. And en route, we were met by Illinois State Police, we were met by the county police, we were met by city police. We had a full procession for Chris. Chris was buried in uniform. His grave marker reads, Chris Gracious, Arizona Trooper. But coming back from Illinois, we had so much response, so much press coverage, and thinking about his mother, how she, happy she was, and I kept thinking, we let him make a wish, and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And right at that time, and this is 33 years ago, that's when the idea was born, the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Let's let them make a wish, and we're going to make it happen. Since that time, because of one little boy, that's now 300,000 children worldwide have received a wish, and when you get an average of four in a family, that's well over a million people that have been impacted just because of one little boy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. When things were the tightest, when things were rough, and uh, why didn't you quit? It, it never dawned on me to quit. And especially, I had a coordinator that I hired to, or not hire, but volunteered to go to the hospitals and learn if there were other children. And every time I thought about quitting, because I'm still working full time. In fact, I'm working other jobs, like most police officers have to do. And she would come back and she'd say, Frank, there's a seven-year-old boy that's in the hospital. He would be a perfect candidate. Frank, I just met this little girl. We've got to get this foundation going. Mm. So when money started coming in to the foundation, there was some success going on. Uh, you decided never to take a penny. Now, it would have been very easy for you to draw a salary. It would be very easy for you to, to have dipped into that well. Why didn't you? I had a job. I was a police officer. I had a job. And I, the people that started, again, working for us, but volunteers, I told them and our board members, we are not going to take any money. 100% of donations are going to go to this charity. Uh, I wanted it built on integrity. I wanted it built on character. And that group that I finally found, and it took a while to find those four other people, they finally, it all worked together. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Frank Shankwitz. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> Every single person in this room has got a God-given gift that the world's waiting to hear. The challenge is so many times we let stinking thinking, we let all the negatives, we let all the obstacles derail us from our destiny. It's time to draw an imaginary line in the sand, literally step across and say, you know what? It is my turn. Just like Les Brown says, it's time to fill our own cup full and then feed the world with what flows over. Right now inside you, you got a story, you got a book, you got an invention, you got a dream, you got a nonprofit, you got a charity. You got something inside you so great that the entire world is waiting to hear from you. What you think is common sense is not common sense to others. You got something inside of you so great that you have no idea the impact that it's gonna make on this generation and for future generations to come. You would not be in this room right now if you didn't have some burning desire inside of you to want more, more out of life, more time, more freedom, more opportunity. And guess what? You have just that. Will you take advantage of it? Will you accept it? Or you let that opportunity just go by. It's time to draw a line in the sand and say, it's my turn. It's my turn to start taking care of people because I don't know you, but I do know this about you. For the last few years, you've been taking care of your family. You've been taking care of your friends. You've been taking care of your loved ones, your boss. It's time to start taking care of you. You deserve it. You paid your dues. You've gone through these past few years of trials and tribulations. You've given everything you've got. You've left it out on the field. Now it's time for you to draw that line in the sand and say, it's my turn. I'm gonna step up to the plate and I'm gonna take my best swing. I might not only hit a home run, but I might hit a single, I might strike out, but at least I'm gonna get up to the plate. It is your turn. You've got greatness inside of you. And when you have it, you grasp it, you hold on to it. You never let another person talk you out of your dream. All you need to keep doing is persevering in the face of adversity. Napoleon Hill said it best, our greatest success will always come just one step beyond our greatest setback and failure. So when you want to say die, when you want to say quit, when you want to throw in the towel, don't do it. All you need is one little word, stickability. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Hype. My name's Tori. Pleasure to meet you, Tori. Nice to meet you. Aren't you the agent for Deepak Chopra and Eckhart Tolle and, and the Dummy series? And for Greg Reed, I think you're here. And for Greg, yeah. yeah. For, at Greg's event here. Because I have this manuscript that I've been working on for a long time, and it would mean a lot to me if you could just take a look at it. Okay. <laughs> this is a novel. Yes. Well, unfortunately, our agency only represents nonfiction. Oh. But I happen to be sitting here with Richard Cohen, the publisher of Beyond Words, and Richard does do novels, so oh. I'm going to give this to wow. Richard, and I'm sure he'll look at it. That would be awesome. I'd be happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. inspirational. You're very welcome. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Hi, honey. How was your day? Amazing.
It's a wrap. <laughs> you kind of wave your hand in my face. Right. <laughs>